1984 in Los Angeles, California. And there he is standing in the terminal of what is looked like a football stadium. And there he is standing in there, and behind him is a massive army of athletes, all organized by height and sport. And he stands there, and he can feel the stadium reverberating, over 100,000 people screaming to the top of their lungs with national pride. The energy is a tangible feeling. Ed Burke stands there as an unbelievable, unlikely candidate for what's about to happen. He's taken a 16-year hiatus from Olympic sports. He's an obscure hammer thrower, to which everybody in the world said, who throws hammers? Nobody throws hammers, but apparently that's a sport in the Olympics. He's taken a 16-year hiatus from Olympic activity. He's the oldest member of Team USA. And he is in an unlikely position. He stands there with the team behind him, and he reflects on the question that a lot of us have asked before, how did I get here? A few days before, he's standing in the lobby of a hotel, and they're all discussing in little pockets of the communities of different sports that they all play for Team USA, who's carrying the flag. The American flag proceeds in front of everybody else, and it's a position of honor. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a highly esteemed role that any athlete would love to have and represent their country by carrying that American flag in the processional, in the opening ceremony of the Olympics. Burke hears the story that there's some hammer thrower that's got the honors. So he goes to the previous gold medal list from the hammer team, that's what they call that. Hammer time. That's what I call it. <laughs> it goes to the previous gold medal from the previous Olympics, and he says, dude, I heard that the guy who's carrying the flag is the hammer thrower. It's you. And he goes, Burke, dude, no, sir. You were voted on. It's you. I mean, he's just overwhelmed with emotion. Me, I'm like in my 40s, and I'm old, and not old, by the way, uh, but I'm old. I have no business doing this. They want you. We want you. So get back into that terminal with me for just a second. And the roar of 100,000 people, it's so loud you can see the reverberation of the blades of grass on the ground. The earth just shakes with pride. The producer comes to him and says, here it is. It's an eight-foot brass pole, solid brass. At the top of the pole is the post of the red, white, and blue. He says in his story that he starts holding it, and his hands are so sweaty and so nervous that the pole just keeps falling in between his hands. So one of the coaches grabs some rocks and starts roughing up the pole, and now it can hold it in his hand. And he said, for national pride, because I love my country and what I want to do, I'm going to take that pole, and I'm going to hold that thing, and I'm going to pull one arm up, and it's the only way you do it. Fist in the air, as high as you can stand it, and I'm going to walk around that entire track. And I'm going to show my pride in my country by one arm the whole time. So it was their time, and he starts to walk. And he walks. This is what it looked like. He walks. Some of you are like, I didn't know they made pictures in black and white. I thought that was a filter on Instagram. No, this is real. This is the only way they did it back then. And he just says, I'm going to hold it holding it right there. What sounded like a great idea suddenly began to be extremely painful. His lacks start to fire, his shoulders, delts, everything, and it's like, uh. And this is not some little wimp. I mean, this dude's ripped. He throws hammers for a living. And what started off as a place of pride, and I want to carry this thing as far as I can, as long as I can, just to show how proud I am to serve in this role. He says, this is really interesting. He just says, then I realized the flag was heavy. There was more to carrying the flag than what he thought was there. There, there, there was more going, there was more to carrying that, oh, I'll just do it, it's no big deal. And then he suddenly realized there's more going on here. I can't do this. I started to think about this particular story, and I started to think about your life and mine, and that's actually what it's like following Jesus. 
that when we first start out, we're absorbed by his love and compassion and forgiveness. We're, we're, un- we're blown away by God's unmerited favor, which is called grace. And we are learning all of these unbelievable truths about our relationship with Jesus. But then something happens as we age in our lives is that there's more to Jesus than we really think there is. The truth is, is that there's more to Jesus going on than we think there is. I'm not saying that it's overly complicated. I'm just saying that there's moments in our lives where we begin to graduate and we begin to learn some deeper truths and there's more going on. There's a weightiness to who he is. There's something about his presence that just changes our lives. The the word becomes alive to us in a different way than it was previously. There's greatness that's there that we didn't realize. And we've seen this whole thing play out, have we not, in the gospel of Mark? So many of you didn't even know there was a book called Mark. You knew there was a Bible, but you didn't know. And so we've learned some of these unbelievable truths that we've unearthed about the life of Jesus, that there was more to Jesus than what we actually thought there originally was. What we're going to see in the Gospel of Mark today, in Mark chapter 12, that there is a lot more to Jesus than we think there is. So if you don't have your Bible, get a copy of God's Word, find it somewhere, steal it from your neighbor, whatever you got to do. Just get a copy of God's Word. And we're going to see first that Jesus comes out with some intense instruction. So we've been on this journey. It's Holy Week, meaning it's the week before Jesus is crucified. And here we are midweek, and all of these people have been asking Jesus this question. They've been coming at him and trying to trip him up and trying to expose his beliefs and trying to just come at him, trying to come at him. And they weren't trying. They were doing it. And every single time Jesus would get asked questions and then he would flip it on them and then he would teach them something and expose a different level and a different layer of who he is and what he was sent to do. Jesus is coming with some great instructions this time because now it's not anybody asking him questions. He's now coming and he's the griller. He's Bobby Flay. He's coming at him. He's he's the one grilling these guys and he's coming at them with some specific stuff. Now, before I get to that, I need to throw out a caveat. So there's a group of uh, some guys in our church and some people that uh, we listen to a particular podcast called For the Gospel. Highly recommend it. And at the very beginning of that uh, podcast, one of the guys, uh, he says that our goal is to bring the cookies from the top shelf and get it down so that everybody can, you know, everybody can enjoy the cookies. And get it out of the cookie jar and let's all eat it and let's have a good time. My attempt in this first point is to get the cookies from the top shelf, get them in the, you know, get it to where you can kind of play with it, break it apart, and kind of look at it from different angles and enjoy the cookie. Are you with me? So what does that mean? What did you just say? This is hard. That's what I'm about to tell you. Like this is a deep theological truth that I'm trying to get down so we can all play with it, so that we can all look at it from different angles, we can all understand it. I also want to give you this little nugget. This is extremely nuanced. This is going to talk about the Trinity. This is going to talk about some Old Testament covenants. And you're like, how are we going to do? We're going to be here all day. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, So, uh, no, we're not going to be here all day. But my point in this is that this is a little bit heady, but I'm going to try to break it down as simple as I can so that we can all understand it. Because you're going to learn that there's more to Jesus than you actually think that there is. Okay? Awesome. So here comes the instruction, and he comes out with a question. He starts this in verse 35. Remember, he's thrown down some major stuff with this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He's going to reference this over and over and over again. And remember, we learned last week that people in our culture have hijacked that and to make it something that it's not really is. And so Jesus is coming at this, and he is going to throw down some awesome truth here. He says in verse 35, and Jesus taught, everybody say Jesus taught, So in case you wonder where I get my points, that's where it starts. Jesus taught. Taught is instructing. It's instructing. That's where that comes from. He's teaching. So I don't make this stuff up. I don't write the mail. I deliver it. That's where it's coming from. So Jesus taught. Where did he teach? In the temple. There we go. See, you guys could do this. You totally could do this. So Jesus taught in the temple. And he said, here's the question. How can the scribes, these religious Pharisees, say uh, say that the Christ, everybody say the Christ, it's the, the Messiah, that the, the, one, the deliverer. How can the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, um, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? How can they say that he's the son of David? So then he goes on and he asks that question and then he starts kind of answering it a little bit. And we'll get to that in just a second. But here's the question. How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of God? Here's where theology happens. So essentially what's happening is you've got this play, this, this kind of word stuff happening. So sonship and being a son is different then than it is now, totally different. And so what Jesus is throwing down is he's saying there's an idea in life 
in the first century that, and by the way, it's not just the first century, it's now too, that Jesus was just a bro. He's a guy. He's just a man. But then Jesus is saying also, in other places in the scripture, I thought he was God. So it's the tension between Jesus being fully God and fully man at the same time. This is a massive point, and we, this matters. This matters more than you think it matters. Like this, your entire existence and forever hinges on Jesus either being just a man or being the God man. And that matters more than you want to even, so we want to talk about a million other things. I don't want to talk about a million other things. I want to talk about this, because this is what matters for you today. And so he says, he poses this question, how can the scribes, these people who actually know better, by the way, say that the Christ is the son of David? So then he's basically posing this idea. Was Jesus just David's son? Now, obviously, David lived centuries before Jesus, so son doesn't mean the same thing. Is it, it's his, his, his relative was Jesus David's relative? I'm putting you on the spot. If you don't know it, it's fine. Just say, I don't know. Yeah, he was. Matthew 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 says that he was, that this is the lineage of the son of David. And so he was a part of his lineage. Verse 6 tells us that David was in the lineage of Jesus and that Joseph comes from that line. And Joseph was his earthly father. And he was born of Mary and Joseph. So, yes, Jesus was the root of David, so to speak. He was the son of David. He also is called the son of man. We studied that a few weeks ago, the son of David, where blind Bartimaeus says, son of David, have mercy on me. It's a linkage back to the historical figure of David, who, by the way, wasn't just about being David. I told you this is a little heady, but David is a picture of the future king that would deliver his people, which would be Jesus. So as David stands in in Israel's history, and he's the great and mighty deliverer who delivers them from the army of the Philistines, David and Goliath isn't about slaying your giant, man. It's not about that. It's about God slaying the giant through Jesus Christ, the giant which is not your problem, it's your sin. And so that's the story of David and Goliath, is that it's Jesus conquering the Goliath of sin in your life, and he chops it off at the head, and he carries it as a trophy. His resurrection is the trophy of the head of the giant. And he stands there in victory over your sin, death, and the grave. And Jesus is the greater David. That's the point of that story. That was really good preaching. Thank you guys very much. So here's the part of this. He's saying, yes, he's man in that he is from the, as a man, he came from the line of David. But he's not just a man. He wasn't David's Lord, lowercase l, but he was David's Lord, capital L. He was divinely sent by the Father. He was born of a virgin, but divinely dispatched from heaven to remedy your sin problem. So, I feel like you're tracking with me, so I'm moving on. So, verse 36, he says, David himself in the Holy Spirit. Sidebar. The Apostle Paul said, nobody can say, call call Jesus Lord without being in the Spirit. So he is inspired under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. David said, he declared, he wrote, he preached, he taught. David said, compelled by the Spirit of God within him, the Lord said to my Lord, which is weird language, but we'll come to that in a second, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. What's David declaring? If you've got time this week, go back and read Psalm 110. Jesus is quoting Psalm 110. Strategy alert. Now, we're not Jews, so we wouldn't know what's going on, but what Jesus, what Jesus is doing is he's, these Jews would fire off. This light bulb would shine, and it would go, wait, what in the world did he just do? Because Psalm 110 was a messianic prophecy of the coming Christ. And this is a very confusing saying. He's saying Jesus, he said, the Lord, which is Yahweh. Jewish people would never even say that word, Yahweh. They took the vowels out. It has no vowels, so they wouldn't write it. And if they would write it, they would go take a bath. Before they would write it, they would wash their hands. They would go through this ritual cleansing. Then they would come. They would write the word Yahweh. Then they would go back, take another bath, and then come back and copy the scripture again. That's how holy that word was. So they didn't even use the word Lord. Um, They didn't use the word Yahweh. They actually just said the name, meaning he is. He's what? He is the anointed Messiah for your life. He is a personal Lord. He is my Lord. Now, really, if we back up and zoom out just a little bit, I told you a little heady. This is God talking to himself. You ever had self-talk before? Self? I feel like we should go get barbecue today after church. To which myself agrees. Amen, self. I had it last night, but there's always a good day. It's a new day. 
His mercies are new every morning, including barbecue. So, thank you, Patrick, for agreeing with me. I appreciate that. So, this is God saying, God, I say to myself, self, I say to myself, what's the plan? The plan is this. Sit at my right hand. In the right hand is a dominant right-hand culture in the Jewish culture. And so what this is, in the Jewish royal court system, the person who would represent the king would sit at the right in the royal court, and they would work on behalf of the king. And he's saying that this Jesus, this future Messiah, is going to sit at the right hand of the Father, which he is, and he is going to be a representative for the people on this earth as the king. And then he comes on and he says, until I put your enemies under your feet. This is what Jesus would do with sin, death, and the grave on the cross. It's a prophecy of what's about to happen, but it's also a future prophecy for stuff that hasn't happened yet. Because you still live in the world, and the world is marred by sin, stained by sin. You fight your flesh just like I do every single day. You ought to be looking forward to heaven for myriad reasons, but the number one reason is no sin. Amen? No sin. Man, I'm so sick of it. I'm so tired of it. It's so annoying, but yet we fight in this tension of a Roman 7 world where it's like the things I don't want to do, I wind up doing. And the things that I do, man, when every time evil is there, you know, it's like pulling me over. It's a lure, and my flesh is wanting to do this. And there's this constant tension back and forth. Am I going to follow Christ? Am I going to follow my flesh? Am I going to follow Jesus? Am I going to follow the culture? Am I following Jesus? Or am I going to do? It's a constant waging of battle in your life and mine. And Jesus actually puts that under his feet at the end of time. In the book of Revelation, it says that he's going to come. He's going to squash the serpent. Actually, Genesis 3 says that. So at the very beginning, he already tells you how it's going to end. And you are now in the tension moment of, less, yes, you are forgiven of your sin as a follower of Jesus, but you're not fully restored until you see Jesus face to face. So this is a powerful verse. He's saying, who, who is he? Oh, this is who he is. He, he can be your personal Lord. He can be your Lord and he can be your leader. He is the one who sits at the right hand of the Father representing the king on this earth. And he represents God in the flesh. If you want to know what Jesus looks like, or God looks like, look at Jesus. That's what he's saying. And, he, and I'm going to operate in his authority. And I'm going to come here and I'm going to remedy the problem of sin in your life and in mine on the cross. And the reality is, is ain't no man going to do that. I know you might think you're manly, but I don't care. You can't do that. You, only God can do that. Only God can fix the sin problem. Only God could actually humble himself in that way to die in your place and to look at the people who would spit on his face, beat him too. Obviously, no human recognition is what Isaiah says. You couldn't recognize him as a human being. And he, he, he literally hung there on the cross for your sin and mine. And a human couldn't do that, but God could do that. And he's saying he's Lord. Even David recognized it as Lord. David knew before all of the cross would ever happen, before the gospel of Mark would ever happen, David's like, yep, he's Lord. Now, we live in a world where that's not very popular. And that's hard to believe. It's hard to believe. You go, well, what does all this matter to me today? How does this impact my heart and my life? Well, because a lot of folks would just wrestle with, I, I don't see how this works. And A.W. Tozer once said that, uh, check out this quote, this is great. Uh, and this has been a powerful quote in my life. And A.W. Tozer, he said these uh, great words uh, many, many, a couple generations ago. He said, um, what I believe about God is the most important thing about me. What you believe about God is the most important thing about you. 100%. What do you think about when you think about Jesus? Is he just a good teacher? A lot of people feel that way. C.S. Lewis made it very famous many, many, many years ago, three particular views of what he, what, when you think about God, what do you believe about Jesus? There are three views. There's actually four now, and I'll give all you four of those. So what do you think about when you think about Jesus? These Pharisees, they probably thought Jesus was a liar. And maybe you think that too. You've got to think about this logic for just a second, though. It takes a lot of faith to believe that Jesus lied. The whole virgin birth thing is a little weird. But the countless miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, too many to count that all of them were fulfilled and happened. Every single Old Testament prophecy thousands of years before Christ ever walked the earth, all fulfilled in Jesus. All of them fulfilled in Christ. 
Every single one of them happened. He uh, dies. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and raised from the dead. So that means he pulled off the most elaborate lie in human history, and generations of people have given their lives to it, followed it, and, and, and I'll die for it. And people have. So Jesus is an incredible liar then. Do you believe that? It takes more faith to believe that Jesus is a liar than it does to believe that he's actually the Lord. Maybe another option is like, no, I don't think Jesus is a liar. Maybe you think he's crazy. Maybe you think he's a lunatic. Now, I understand that because Jesus made some pretty bold claims. Matter of fact, even his family thought he was crazy. You remember the study of Mark, early Mark. His mom's like, you need to knock that off. You're going to die. He's like, I know. That's why I came. No, but you're, that's a lot of crazy talk. Even Peter, as Jesus made one of the announcements that he's going to be uh, beaten, crucified, buried, dead, and rise again, Peter goes, that's crazy talk, man. You need to knock that off. And what did Jesus do? He pulls him off to the side and says, get behind me, Satan. Jesus makes three massive predictions about what he was going to do with his life, and everybody's like, that's crazy. That's crazy. And it's only crazy until his actions verify what he did. Until you get to Mark chapter 16. When you get to Mark 16, uh, and you get later into the, the story of the crucifixion, Mark 16, 6, it says that an angel showed up when Mary and the lady show up to the tomb. And it says that you seek Jesus of Nazareth. You're coming looking for this guy who was crucified. Just to be sure you know, he died. And they're like, yeah, I know, I get it. We're here to help. We're here to uh, work on the body and make sure the body's still there and preserve uh, his body. And then he says, oh, wait, hold on. He's risen. He's not here. You seek the living among the dead is what the other trans, one of the other translations say. He says, see the place where you laid him. He was here, but he's no longer here. You seek something that is alive. You thought it was dead, but he's actually alive. So all the crazy talk about dying on the cross and raising from the dead, it does seem crazy. Like some obscure guy from Nazareth, some know-nothing manipulative liar, and tell, guess what happens? He rises from the dead. Therefore, he's no longer crazy. It's true. Now, some people might say, I don't know, the Gospels, like, come on, man. All, that's really God's Word. That's just really the Word of God. So maybe you just believe he's a legend. Maybe you believe he's a legend. He's just a guy to look up to. Like, he, man, it's just great writings, and these gospel writers, they just, they, they wanted somebody to have somebody to look up to. So we're just going to look at, uh, we're just going to, like a David, we're going we're gonna to go after him. We're just going to model our lives after him. Here's the problem with that. The Bible itself. The Bible is not legend. It's historical fact. Can you help me with that? Yes. I'm so glad that I can help you with this. Let me give you some facts here just to help you, and especially for those of you that are skeptical of faith, or you've got some people in your lives that are skeptical of faith, this is going to help them to understand the veracity, the faithfulness, the reliability of the actual Bible, that it's historical fact. Here we go. Put your thinking cap on. There are more than 5,600 Greek New Testament manuscripts to the Gospels. What's a manuscript? Writings. It's the writing of the actual Gospel. 5,600 complete manuscripts of the New Testament, the Greek New Testament. What's awesome is the reason we're doing Mark is because the gospel of Mark and Matthew, by the way, are both within 20 years of the actual resurrection. So that means that Mark, by the way, is getting the living testimony of Peter. That's the account of this. It's Peter's testimony. Mark's writing it down. And Mark is writing down Peter's story. And he's going, Peter's alive. They're old dudes. And within 20 years of the resurrection, they're like, okay, so let's talk about what did he do first? What did he do second? What did he do third? Not Mark 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 16. They're documenting this. Matthew, all 28 verses. He's that Dude's a nerd. Every detail you can imagine, he was an accountant. Sorry if you're an accountant. I love you. But it's a spreadsheet guy. That's what he's doing. And he's documenting every single thing, writing it all down as it's happening. He's like, okay, pulling out his mole skin. He's writing all this stuff down. And he's making sure all of this is, he's writing all the notes of what he's seen Christ do within 20 years of it actually happening. They saw it. It was an eyewitness account. So these copies of the New Testament manuscripts, like nobody denies the fact that those manuscripts are real. Nobody denies the fact that they're faithful and true. Nobody does. It's called textual criticism if you want to look at it. Nobody denies that. You want some more proof? Sure you do. Here we go. There are also 10,000 New Testament manuscripts in Latin. There are also 25,000 early manuscripts of God's Word to date. You have a total of 25,000 manuscript evidence of the actual faithfulness, historical documentation that the Bible actually happened. Well, that's just not enough for me. Really? You believe in far less 
Anybody ever read Homer's Iliad? Remember, did you ever anybody read that in high school? Nobody, nobody debates that that book ever existed. Nobody ever, never questions its reliability. How many manuscripts do you think they have of the original text? 643. Partial manuscripts that they piece together the whole story. The scales are tipped mightily into the reliability of the Bible that you hold in your hands. Over 25,000 manuscripts of complete faithfulness. And, oh, well, there's some disagreements. Maybe over commas, friend. But not over the message, not over the content. 25,000 manuscript evidence of the reliability of the Bible. Well, that's not enough. Cool. I'll give you secular history. You ready for some secular history? Jewish historian Josephus. That's a fun name to say. I quote him quite often. Tacitus, Roman historian. Lucian of Samosata. Uh, I'm messing that up. Of Samosata. Uh, they all document every event that happened in the New Testament. They document in their own secular writings. That's still not enough. He's still a legend to me. Let me give you just a real life one. What would it take for your older brother to convince you that he was the savior of the world? Older brothers have Messiah complexes. I understand that. But what would it take for your older brother to convince you that he's the Savior of the world? Believe in me, and you'll never die. Really? Imagine playing, like, I, I don't know, video games with your brother, and he's like, you should follow me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No, sir, not happening. It's all crazy until it happens. James is the little brother of Jesus, and he was skeptical his entire life of Jesus, who he said he was. And then upon the resurrection, James was, James was converted and believed. It would take a preponderance of actual historical evidence for you to believe that your brother's going to die and then rise again and then do it. Then you would believe. Amen? There's no, like, guys, it takes more faith to believe that Jesus is a, li a, a liar, a lunatic, or a legend than it does to believe the ultimate thing, but he's just the Lord. Like he's the Lord, the anointed one of God, sent to this place to literally ransom you from your sin and save you from your life and to give you an eternal spot in heaven forever. It takes, listen, one old, my old school monk said this, the simplest answer is often the right answer. So it's just a lot easier to believe that he's Lord than he is a liar, a lunatic, or a legend. So if you're in the world of skepticism trying to, well, the veracity of the Bible and all those other things, that's a legitimate argument. But the reality is, is you just got to believe. And that's what Jesus is putting before these guys. They thought he was a liar. They thought he was crazy. They thought, no, nah, there's no way that he could be the Messiah. And he's like, no, here's the deal. I'm Lord. So the question for you is, is he your Lord? Is he your Lord? Only you can answer that. What a massive moment of Jesus just dropping the proverbial mic and saying, I'm either your Lord or I'm not. And that's the question he's putting in front of you today is, have you trusted in him? It was 1929 and it was the Rose Bowl. This particular Rose Bowl would have been probably the most unique Rose Bowl in Rose Bowl history. Other than maybe the World War II era when they moved it from Pasadena to North Carolina. Bizarre. Some of you don't even know that happened. But 1929 was one of the most bizarre Rose Bowls ever because Cal, the California Bears, played the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Bizarre also because I don't think the Yellow Jackets have ever been to the Rose Bowl ever again. But late into the second quarter, the tensions were high and Cal fumbles the ball and Roy Regals recovers the ball. And as he recovers the ball, he's caught up with all this emotion. He's jacked that he recovered the ball. And he finds a seam. He makes a turn. And he just sees a hole and runs. And runs and runs and runs and runs. And he is after it, just loving that he's got nothing but end zone out in front of him. For 60 yards, he's running. Unbeknownst to him, the sidelines, here he is, the sidelines, the coaches, and everybody who is a Cal fan is going, Roy, wrong way, wrong way. You need to turn around. 
coaches are running on the sidelines, and everybody's like, what are you doing? You can almost see a grin in his face. He's like, oh, my gosh, this is exciting. I can't wait. And then for 60 yards, the quarterback, Benny Long, runs and tackles him right before he gets to the end zone. In 1929, a famous line was, Roy, great play, wrong way. (laughs) Wrong way. Here we find Jesus, as this instruction changes, there's an indictment that comes up. And Jesus is literally screaming at the Pharisees, maybe, but maybe even through just what he says, it feels like screaming, is wrong way. You are actually going the wrong way. The destination, the end zone you're running towards, ruin, 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 stop. Whatever you're doing, stop, 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 stop. And he's flagging them down. As you pick up in the text, we see this indictment, and some of you are like, what's an indictment? Thanks for asking. I actually researched that for you at justice.org this last or justice.gov this week. And it really means is to bring the charges of guilt upon another person. So what are these guys guilty of? Well, step number one, they're guilty of living for personal gain. It's all about what they wanted in the game. It was about them. So it was personal gain. How does this flesh out? It starts with praise. It was all about the praise. Everybody say all about the praise. Come on, you just got a part of the sermon. It was all about the praise right there. Verse 38, the text picks up and it says, And he was teaching and said, Beware of the scribes. That's the warning. What's the warning about? What are they? Oh, they like to walk around. Everybody say like. Say it like a valley girl, like from the 90s. Yeah, I, I heard some of you. That was great. Sorry, I was self-editing right there. Uh, who like to walk around in log ro- long robes and light greetings in the marketplace. He says, beware of these scribes. They like to walk around. They like the greetings. Here, here's what they happened. Is these long robes were usually white, and it symbolized purity. It symbolized their scholarship. It symbolized their hard work. These are, these are smart men. These are men that have given their life to theology and doctrine and, and leading the church. And so uh, it was a symbol of their faithfulness. The, the, the funny part about this, not funny, it's actually totally wrong. Uh, but they, what used to be temple outfits, just call it like that, they became public outfits. Which screamed, look at me. So when they walk out of their house and they walk in the market and they're wearing their robes and people are like, oh, that's an important dude. That guy's got something to say. Look at all the work he's done. Look at how cool he is. And they're, oh, oh, oh. And they're just doing, oh, I don't know if they did it like that, but however they did it, it was public praise where they were just rolling out the red carpet for this guy. Just rolling out, letting him just just do whatever he wanted to do, wherever he wanted to do it, and whoever he wanted to do it with. And they fed off of it. They fed off of that public praise. Pretty sure we probably do too, don't we? A lot of us love the applause of men. The longer I've lived, the more I realize that if you read the headlines that people are sending your way, you will get prideful and arrogant every time. Don't believe the headlines everybody's sending your way. All the public praise. I'm not saying you've got to be critical. But what I am saying is, is that you've got to take that with a grain of salt because your heart is prone to believe all the praise. And then it, what it does is it suppresses truth. The only person that they should praise and you should praise is Jesus. So like when you come to a staff member, you come to me. Some of you say this, and I'm not trying to call you out, okay? But you say, good sermon. Don't say that. Say, God spoke through you today. Because then what that does is when you say good sermon to me, it feeds ego. And it feeds pride because I could care less of whether you like my words. I want you to love his word, which is why we preach the way that we do here and why we do verse by verse through the Bible. Because the Bible dictates our messages. The Bible dictates our points. The Bible dictates what we talk about. So just say, God spoke to you through you today. I heard the voice of God through the Lord today. I understand when you say good sermon. I know most of you. And I love you. And you don't need to do that. But you've got to be careful because we can start believing the praises of men over the word, very word of God more. And we're all guilty of it. It moves on and it goes from the praise to position. It says that they get the best seats in the house. By the way, I just want to just quickly say that when you wear those like weird clothes like that out, and uh, and that would be just picture it like this. It'd be like you rocking your cap and gown from your graduation to Kroger. Magna cum laude. Signa cum laude. School of business. Who cares? (laughs) 
I know some of you are so stuck on what high school you went to. Most of the world talks about what college you went to, and I get that Cincinnati thing. I totally get it. I know you do, but nobody else does. So then it comes down to, it's not about the praise, but it's about position. It says they get the best seats in the house. So it's like the idea of being the, the, the temple being full, lines at the door, waiting to get in. And the, there's reserved, roped off seating. It says reserved. And it's, uh, oh, oh, that's for those guys. That's for those family members. Like, you must be important to sit there. They get the, roll out the red carpet, and they get the best seats in the house. And really, they're just letting those people do that versus saying, I'm just like you. I put my robe on just like you did. I put my pants on the same way you did. I brush my teeth too, so do you, hopefully. And they're just elevating a man when God never intended for you or me to elevate a man over any other man. You elevate the man, which is Jesus. Then they go for prominence. It says they get places of honor at feasts. It says, I, they're a status-conscious people in a status-conscious culture. You people, like, not you people, I don't say it like that, sorry. Here we go. People in general like to say the Bible's, the Bible's irrelevant. Not at all. So relevant. They were a status-conscious people in their world. That's why they walked the way they did. They talked the way that they did. I pray like this. I don't pray like that. I, I wear these clothes. I look the part. I'm showing up into the market. I got the, I'm looking the way I need to look so that everybody knows who I am. Sounds like 2021 to me. Making sure that everybody sees you. Like, I'm so annoyed. Oh, I'm done. That's, that's a podcast episode. We'll turn that into that. We're not going to turn it into a sermon. I got to move on. Jeez Louise. Everybody say move on. Don't you dare say it, actually. We're moving on. So here's the point is that these people were all about the personal perks that they got and cared little about practicing piety, the faithfulness of God, like practicing their faith, and they had wrong priorities. It's just about being noticed. It's about being noticed. It's about getting their personal gain. And and this is a tension that everybody faces, but even people in ministry face it. If you're trying to jockey position to get on some team here or some committee, we don't have that, just for the record. Why? Because people jockeying for position and power, it's sinful. And we all do that. We all, we all struggle with that. And so even pastors struggle with that. And if I do what I do for personal gain, I already told you that I, I, I preach the truth and I don't look at your face. Remember that sermon? You guys, you go back and watch that. Because we deliver the truth whether we like it or not. I heard somebody say this week that, like, man, just, just I love, just leave. Aaron, just be the just just be our pastor. Just leave. Just do it. I felt I had two people say that in a matter of five days to me, and that was so encouraging to me to go. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Um, and I'm digressing a little bit, but I just want you to know that it's easy to get into the the vein of receiving headlines, receiving praise, and uh, if I'm in this for public gain, guess what happens? I'm just going to tell you, God takes them out, and He doesn't need your help. <laughs> He killed two people in the Bible. God did that? Yeah, he did. Ananias and Sapphira. Because they were in it for themselves, in it for their own gain. And he, they were vaporized with the thump of that old Gentile temple. They would have gone there because they were in it for the wrong reasons. And so we ought to feel the weight of that. I do every week. I'm standing right up here before I get up here and I'm like, God, please don't let me blow it. Please let me be faithful to your word. Miss Joyce gave me a card a few weeks ago that said, uh, preaching a sermon on a Sunday is like giving birth, and every Monday is a reminder that you're pregnant again. That's my world. <laughs> and I feel the pressure of that every week, and if that pressure enough is enough. <laughs> you know what's interesting, though, is we begin hearing the mail and the headlines from everybody else and the personal gain, you know what happens? Uh, we begin to suppress the truth, and when we suppress the truth, it leads to public shame. We become numb to the truth of God's Word. We nullify the Bible. We don't believe it because we start believing, I'm legit, I'm awesome, look at the market. Everybody told me how awesome I was. And then we start to believe that, and then we start uh, forgetting what the Bible actually tells us to do. And then we start making ways to justify our behavior in our life. So we start making laws or we start making rules or we start making mandates that don't make any sense. 
And that's what these people did. They prayed. What do you mean prayed? Well, they prayed spiritual prayers. Look at the text. It says that they went and uh, they played a pretense of long prayers. Other texts tell us that they prayed these prayers and said, I'm not like these people. Listen to how I pray. Thee thou vaughtest. They didn't speak in King James, though some of you believe that, and you were raised that way. They didn't do that. They didn't speak in the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, they, they spoke in the Pharisee version of the Bible. They just spoke in language that nobody understood. It was about being noticed. It was about being polished. It was about being pristine. And that's what they were doing. They were empty words that God never heard because their heart was disingenuous. And that prayer indicts their action because if it's real prayer, then they wouldn't do what they did. They prayed prayers, but they also prayed on people. Look at the text. It says that they devoured the widow's houses. They know what the scripture says. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 17, the scripture is absolutely clear. And it says this. Just listen to this. You don't have to turn there. Um, it, it, it says that uh, they uh, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. Their text in Exodus, it says in Exodus 22, verse 22, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. They knew that they should protect these women and not um, marginalize these women, but they did it anyway because they saw great gain. That word devour means to eat. It means to rob. It means to steal. And so they would come in, and I know this is weird, but uh, in our day, we have separation of church and state, okay? In their day, they did not have separation of church and state. Their religious leaders were often their lawyers, their accountants, <laughs> their architects, uh, they were their temple people. They did everything. And so they were the bank. They did all of it. And so if somebody lost their husband, they would go to them and say, I need some help. And what these religious leaders would do, the same thing they did with the, uh, the, same thing they did with the uh, exchange rate in the temple, they would just marginalize those women, take their stuff. It's now a temple property. We just got a parsonage, y'all. Check it out. And that's how it was. And it became a part of them. And then they left an already vulnerable group of society already vulnerable, now more vulnerable and more oppressed. And then they created laws around that to justify their actual behavior. I don't think we've ever done that. Do you have any examples of that? I do. I have a historical one and a modern one. Are you ready for it? 1833 in England. Let's get outside of our country for just a minute. 1833 in London, England, there was a particular research uh, commission sent out to talk about child labor laws. It said that there were the average age of the worker in London, England in 1833, the 19th century, was under the age of 13. Under the age of 13. Uh, there was a particular commission that was done that found that there were 60,000 adult men, 65,000 adult women, and 80,000 children in the labor force under the age of 13. Uh, they had these particular roles called trappers. The trappers would climb through these little coal mine tunnels. That's what this, this young guy did. He was in a coal mine as a young boy, and he was a trapper. And the trapper was a crucial part of their uh, business because they were the ventilators of the coal mine so that people wouldn't suffocate and die because the oxygen level goes way down when you're in a coal mine. And so they're there, and they're to open the vents, close the vents, open the vents, close the vents, open the vents, and close the vents for over 16 hours in utter darkness. That's how these children lived. Oftentimes, uh, flogging was a part of the business day where they would beat the children into submission. Other times, uh, parents saw the family budget and saw reality and saw that this end was inevitable, but it was also desirable to the point where even dads would contract labor their children to make more money. That sounds like human trafficking. They were pimping their kids for a dollar. All the while, the church was relatively silent. Knowing the truth about the dignity of human life and that children are like arrows in a quiver, the psalmist says. They're a gift from God, Proverbs tells us. And here are these men who led these factories, worked in these cotton mills, and were uh, responsible to their church boards and leading in old school Sunday school classes. And here they are, marginalizing a particular group of society, totally justified in their 
cult, in their culture in that day and age because, hey, we've got all this stuff that we've got to do. We've got all this product that we've got to create. And the church was relatively silent until the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury showed up and said, enough. No, 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 this is not right. And so he began to be an advocate for these children in the eight, in 1833 and said, we've got to, like, we, here's what the Bible says, and this is what culture is saying, and it is counter to what the Bible says. And so he stood with a strong backbone and stood boldly and stood for truth and said, we cannot do this. All it takes is one. A modern example. This isn't easy. A modern example is the state-sanctioned murder of unborn children in the womb. Uh, Here's the text, Scripture. Let me give you a good example in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, Mary shows up to Elizabeth's house, her family. Mary has the Messiah in her belly. Elizabeth has John the Baptist in her belly. Cousins. Mary walks into the room. The text tells us, that John the Baptist, in Elizabeth's womb, jumps for joy. If that's not a case for the cause of life inside the womb of a woman, I don't know what would be. Then you go back into David's testimony, and he says this in uh, Psalm 139, For you created me in my my mom's inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Jeremiah says that you knew me before you formed me. The Bible has verse after verse after verse after verse after verse that life happens in the womb at conception. And I would just tell you today that maybe, perhaps, the most dangerous place to live is not in the inner city, but in the womb of a mom. And some might say, well, I just don't believe that life begins in conception, so that's why I'm okay with this. You ready for some science? from a secular website that your tax dollars fund? The National Institutes for Health, NIH.gov. Go there and find it yourself. Tells us that 23 chromosomes from the man, 23 chromosomes from the woman, come together, and what is that math? 46. 46 chromosomes create one life. From the moment that that sperm fertilizes that egg in the zygote format, Guess what happens? 46 chromosomes are present. You know what that website tells us? That all it takes to have life is 46 chromosomes. So from the moment that that seed is fertilized by that father's sperm, there are 46 chromosomes and there is life right there from the moment of conception. It's unbelievable that in our day and age that that simplicity Why is this such a big deal? Why are you saying this? 1973, Roe v. Wade passed. Since 1973, to the most current numbers I could find on Thursday, 61.8 million babies have been aborted. Just let me give you a concrete example. Take the entire population of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and toss in Hawaii. Gone. Gone. All of them. No longer here. This matters. This piece of your life matters. And when culture says it's okay, God's word says, no, it doesn't. It's not okay. And I said state sanctioned for a reason because about 616 million of your tax dollars fund that, just like mine. You don't think that matters? Come on, y'all, don't leave me up here by myself. You don't think that matters? Now, now, hear me say this. I know that some people make decisions when they're younger or even last week that you look back and you go, maybe you were a part of that. Maybe you did that. Can I give you some good news? There's grace for you. There's grace for that. Like God's grace is amazing. That's why we wrote about it, and it's an ancient song we sing. It's amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
It's beautiful. And His grace can meet you there. And show you that it's okay. Jesus is that good to welcome you with open arms. This is an issue that we've got to face. And what I want to just say that when you begin to suppress the truth, this is where this is all coming from, and it's all about public praise, all about what culture says, all about what's looking awesome on the outside, it's all about status, it's all about what I get out of the deal. You suppress the truth, then you start making public decisions that impact people, and you devour people. You seeing it in the text? Do you see it there? I agree. Thank you. That's where we're at. And that's the indictment that the Lord is giving on us in our generation. Billy Graham said that all it takes, boldness and courage, all it takes is one man who's bold, one woman who's bold and courageous that stands strong, and then guess what happens? It stiffens the backs of everybody else around them. Can I just tell you that in this day and age, I'm about to preach, any time in this day and age right now, what I want and what I want our church to be is a people that stand flat-footed on the truth of God's Word, and if I stand strong, and it's nerve-wracking, and it makes me nervous, believe me, it makes me nervous, because this stuff goes out on the internet, and it makes me nervous, but I've got to stand confident on the truth of God's Word, and when I stand, then you stand, and we stiffen each other's backs, and when I'm having a tough day, and I see Mike doing it, and I'm watching Mike post some legit stuff, I'm watching you stand strong in your business, Derek, and you're leading strong. I'm seeing Andy do that. I'm seeing you students do that in your classes. And we're all doing that together. Then like-minded people rise up. And like we just say, salvation begins to rise. Freedom begins to rise. And the truth of God prevails in a generation that absolutely, foundationally needs it. So Jesus gives us instruction and then an indictment and lands on an illustration to wrap it all up. He drops the mic and takes a seat. He backs up and he watches. Remember, it's Passover, millions of people in the city of Jerusalem. And he just watches. And people start to line up. And he's watching these people give at these 13 little boxes all over the temple courtyard. And some people are walking in, not thinking much about it, and just dropping their coins in there. And it's obvious who they are because the clangity, clang, clang, clang is weighty, weighty, weighty. Lots of it falling. And then they just go about their business. Then, out of the corner of his eye, he notices a lady with her hand in her pockets. And there she is with her head held low, not paying attention to anybody else, can't even see that Jesus is looking at her. And just starts rubbing those coins together in her pocket. Two of them. A day's wage in the ancient world was a denarii. This lady, she had two coins that equaled one penny, which was one sixty-fourth of a day's wage. She had nothing. And as all the clanging is happening, all the clanging is happening, Jesus is over here, and all the clanging is happening, and she just moves this way, takes a step forward, missing her husband, knowing that Should I tell the temple? What are they going to do to me? I've heard of my friends who've lost their husband. They've lost their house. Now they're homeless. What are they going to do? Should I even tell them? Should I even make a mention that I lost my husband? All the while in her pocket, rubbing those two coins together. She finally gets up to her turn. It's the free will offering, which is irony at its finest. Because the free will offering goes to fund the salaries of the temple people who were ultimately excluded. And she gave faithfully, not to the temple, but to the Lord of the temple. And drops those two coins in there, and it makes no sound. And at that moment, that's when Jesus says, Boys, 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 come here. Did you see that? She has no clue. I actually believe to this very day she's in heaven and has no clue. But when she stands before the Lord of the judgment seat of Christ, He will say, you have no idea, honey, how many generations have heard the story of your faithfulness. And she will receive her crown of glory. And Jesus is saying, she gave more than anybody else. He says it, look. Many rich people put in large sums. 
he's not mad at the rich people. He's just saying they put in large sums. And the poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly, like, y'all, lean in, truly. I say to you, this poor widow has put in more. Interesting wordplay. Put in large sums. Uh, she, what it is, put in two small copper coins. She has put in more than all those who were contributing to the offering box. All of them. All of them. The people with rolling in the Benjis. I'm talking a lot of zeros before the comma. Or before the decimal. More than all of them. For they all, here's the, here is what Jesus is saying. Here's the issue. Here's why she gave more. Because they contributed it out of their abundance. They gave and didn't feel it. You ever heard that idea? You need to be, the only way you know if you're generous is if you give and you feel it. I'm going to argue a lot more than that, by the way. Some of you who don't like to tithe, and you're like, I'm a New Testament giver. I'm about to throw this up, upside down. But she, God is, not me. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. All she had to live on. There's these two things at play. It's the abundance mindset and the scarcity mindset. The abundance mindset were uh, these folks who were coming in with a ton of money in their accounts. And they came out of the abundance of their wealth and then just dropped that money in. The reality is, is that at the same time, there was a lady who, for all intents and purposes, had a scarcity mindset. She had nothing. Her bank account had nothing. We don't even know if she actually had a home. We have no idea. Maybe the previous story was about her. Maybe she was a widow who got the, her stuff to value. We don't know the ins and outs of that. But again, she is the one who represents scarcity. But in my greater estimation is it's actually the people who had the wealth that were actually the ones that lived in scarcity. How do I know that? Because the more money that you get and the more money I get is the more propensity we have to worry. How many of you got enough more than you ever had in your life? And your white knuckle grip in every single thing you got. My friend, you do not have an abundance mindset. You have a scarcity mindset. Even if you've got hundreds of thousands of dollars in your bank account and you go on legit vacations and you got a sweet ride and you bought your wife some sweet jewelry for your, her anniversary and you didn't go to Kohl's and buy it, you went to an actual you went to an actual jeweler and bought it, custom built that. You send your kids to private school. They do a million different sports, all those things. And you have all this stuff, but at the end of the day, your money's got you in its grips. Jesus says that's where your treasure is, is where your heart is also. And he's coming after it because he wants your heart more than he wants your stuff. And sometimes he's got to go by way of your stuff to get your heart. And so the widow was the one living in abundance. She was the one who said, I don't have anything, but take all that I have. You see, generosity... <laughs> isn't measured in what's given. Generosity is measured in what is kept. You got a lot, you keep in a lot? That's a clear indicator that you might not be as generous as you think you are. The starting place for our generosity starts in Malachi 3. We start with the tithe. That's the training ground. That's pre-K, friends. But that's not where we end. Where we end is, God, you have it all. It's a story of a young couple that's at our church that at the end of the fourth quarter of last year, that's what they did. They said, God, it's yours anyway, and we feel called to give. That doesn't promise that you're going to get an abundance coming back to you. <laughs> there is no guarantee of that. We have no record of what happened to this lady after she did this. We don't know if she, it's not like she put her two coins in and then had a bins out in the parking lot. It's not the way that that works. It's not the way the economy of heaven works. Not that God's a hater on that kind of stuff, but he'll come to you through that stuff and say, hey, does that car have you? Does that house have you? Does that stuff have you? Does that influence have you? Does that cool little blue check mark on your social media have you? Does that title influencer have you? Those followers, they have you? He's coming after that because that where your heart is, that's your treasure, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is, and Jesus wants your heart. He's the Lord of your heart. So I, I think when we look at all of this, friends, I 
think what we've got to ask ourselves is where is our heart in our giving? Are we the people that when we give, we're like, oh man, really? Or are we the people that when I say, let's turn our hearts toward giving, we're like, oh my gosh, here it is. This is the time that we've all waited for. It's time to give. If you don't do that next week, we're starting this whole thing over again. But it's a time of my heart is, and I'm ready to give all that I have to him. And what I've learned in my life, and you've probably learned in yours, is that God honors that every single time. Because he wants your heart. It's not necessarily about the amount. It, there is a good starting place biblically for that. But he wants your heart. He wants your everything. That's what he wants to do. And Jesus is saying, tie back to last week, this young, this woman here, this is what it looks like to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is what it looks like, by the way, to love your neighbor as yourself. Because when she put that in, she just did it because it was faithfulness to God, not faithfulness to the temple. Because those people are going to exploit her anyway. She did it, and she said, this is what God's called me. She was loving God and loving people at the exact same time. Boys, this is what it's going to look like. Friday's coming. The brutality of the cross is coming. You're going to want to run for the hills. But this is what faithfulness and loving God looks like. It's radical surrender. Radical surrender. I give it up, and I gain it all. Isn't that beautiful? So the invitation is actually very, very simple today. Is he your Lord? Only you can answer that question, and the only way that you receive him is by your faith. Express your faith and trust in him. Turn from your sin. Turn to him. And he will save you, and he will be your Lord. Are you going to let his word shape your life? Or are you going to let praise shape your life? We're either going to be people of the book or we're going to be subject to the look of culture on us. And we'll fluctuate. We'll suppress truth. Romans 1. You know what happens when we suppress truth? The Bible says in Romans 1, God gave him up. If you want to go for it. You're living in a Romans 1 world right now because of the suppression of truth. We're not going to suppress the truth, are we? The Bible's going to be our authority of our life. It either is or it isn't. And I think we're people who say it is. It is an is thing. The Bible is our authority, and it's our source for life, and that's what we're going to be. And then, are you going to be a generous giver? And I obviously affect every word said to me, but you are. But deeper, are you going to love him and trust him supremely? Over all things. Father, we come to you, and we recognize that your word is strong and true. And it's the only thing we can stand on. And today, Heavenly Father, we ask that you allow us in this time to just respond to you. If you're here today and you need to make him your Lord, do it now. Jesus, you are my Lord. I've never done this. I've been playing around my whole life with spiritual things. This is the time. Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe you're the Savior. I confess you as Lord in this moment. Do it now. Others of you, you need to make some personal decisions and stake your claim on the authority of God's word. I live my life by that. Others of you, God has only had a piece of your heart, not all of your heart. That's the story of that woman. She gave it all. Maybe you need to do that today.